Gentlemen, how are you guys doing tonight? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, you know, I would usually make a joke about how your level of enthusiasm is exactly what I expect, but now it's no longer a joke because now we have four years of Trump. This is exactly what I expect when I think enthusiasm. So I'm going to be doing a bit of political humor, but to start things off, I wanted to just bring up something that happened recently, and that is the death of Canada's greatest son, Leonard Cohen. Now, I, I honestly wasn't shocked when I heard Leonard Cohen died. I think we all knew he was going to die this year. Like, this year was just one death after another, and then you just look like, who could, be, who, who could possibly be next? I mean, Glenn Frey died. There's no one bigger than that. Oh, fucking Prince? What's next, Leonard Cohen? We said it as a joke. We said it as a joke. And then it happened. But it didn't just happen. Coincidentally, um, I can't remember her last name, but Marianne, the muse of Leonard Cohen. Yeah, um, the muse and the inspiration for So Long, Marianne, which is my favorite Leonard Cohen song. Oh, sorry. Now I have restless legs. But now, Marianne also died earlier this year. He recently released an album, and then he was doing an interview after the album got released, and they asked him, so what are your plans now? And he straight up said, I'm just waiting to die. That, that would be shocking out of anybody else except Leonard Cohen. This is one of the greatest songwriters of all time. A man who has performed with fucking everybody. He has written, he wrote one of the most covered songs of all time, Hallelujah. It's been in fucking everything. He can actually say, I have nothing else to do. I'm just waiting to die. So I respect him so much more after his death than I ever did while he was alive. And that's saying a lot because he's one of my favorite musicians ever. He is one of the best songwriters that's ever existed. But also, he had a fucking shitty voice. We just gotta admit that. I'm sorry, but we just have to admit he had a shitty voice. That's why he writes them. Exactly. That's why he writes them. And now it's just kind of sad because Bob Dylan's the last one. All we have now is Bob Dylan. Everyone else from that era that was of major importance is gone. Who else do we have besides Bob Dylan? Don McLean. And what the fuck has he done in the past 20 years? Nothing. He wrote American Pie and he was just like, oh, fuck this, I'm done. You guys like that one, I don't even write anything else. And that precedes the music portion of tonight. Let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get started with part 11 of my series entitled, If He Gets Elected, I'm Leaving the Country, entitled The Fat and the Curious. Because today we will be covering Presidents William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson. Now, before I talk about William Howard Taft's presidency, let me explain his role in the Roosevelt candidacy the Roosevelt administration. You see, William Howard Taft was Roosevelt's Secretary of War and his best friend in politics. He was also Roosevelt's hand-picked successor after he left the White House. Now the problem with this is that being a hand-picked successor leads to what I like to call the Van Buren effect, which is what I named because Martin Van Buren was Andrew Jackson's appointed successor. And the problem with that is that right after Andrew Jackson left office and Van Buren took over, a huge economic crisis happened and Martin Van Buren made it to where we didn't elect another vice president for goddamn for a goddamn century. That's how bad he was. Technically, the next vice president we elected was Richard Nixon, but I don't fucking count that. He didn't get elected immediately afterwards. He lost to Kennedy, then he was decided, you know what, I'm not gonna lose to another Kennedy, fuck this. And he didn't, he fucking didn't. I'll get to that later though. But the big thing about William Howard Taft is that he was a decent man and a great constitutionalist. Roosevelt's mindset was, if the Constitution does doesn't say that I can't do it, then I can. William Howard Taft was more of a Jeffersonian personality where he says, yeah, it doesn't say that you can't do it in the Constitution, but it doesn't say that you can either, so fuck off, dude. 
And so Taft got into odds with Roosevelt almost immediately, which was kind of shocking because Taft kept forward a lot of the policies that Roosevelt had started. He kept on with the civil reform that Roosevelt was trying to keep moving. And he also used the Sherman Antitrust Act to bring down Rockefeller. That's right. Let me repeat that. Rockefeller, one of the most well-known names throughout American history, was brought down by William Howard Taft, something that Roosevelt couldn't even do. And yet this wasn't good enough for Theodore Roosevelt, was it? Oh no, this was far from it. He started getting personal with it. And he started going after Taft for shit he had no control over. The biggest thing being the biggest thing. Taft was the fattest president we have ever had to this day. There's a legend that is often considered very true that he got stuck in the White House bathtub and had to be lifted out with a fucking machine. Now, I don't want to make any false accusations, but doesn't that say more for how great the food is at the White House than anything else? I mean, the White House chef should have gotten a medal after that. You got the president stuck in a bathtub because he was so addicted to your meals. I hope you are put at the top echelon of chefs. Just continue your line of work however you see fit. And then that guy ended up having a son named Guy Fieri. And then everything just went downhill for the family immediately afterwards. And so, William Howard Taft, as I said, pissed off Roosevelt. Roosevelt decides, fuck you, 1912's coming around, I'm running for president again. I'm running for the Republican Party. The Republicans said, oh no, you fucking don't. We got rid of you for a reason. Stay out. They renominated Taft. No effort whatsoever put into that. They were just like, no, anything's better than him. Don't give us Roosevelt again. So Roosevelt decides, screw you guys, I'm still running. Decides to run third party. It was a very personal battle. He took everything very personally. If you weren't 100% with him, you were nothing but a treacherous scumbag who wanted to see America fall victim to the Democratic machine. That's how, that's Roosevelt blood running strong, ladies and gentlemen. And so Roosevelt was on the campaign trail and one of the biggest presidential campaign disasters happened. He was about to give a speech and some crazy nutbag shot Theodore Roosevelt. No! Shot him right in the chest. And the reason that the guy shot him in the chest is actually very fun. It's one of my favorite facts ever. He shot him because Roosevelt, when he was first president, he had taken over for William McKinley. And this guy had a dream that William McKinley rose from his coffin and said, Theodore Roosevelt is my murderer. Take revenge on me. And he decided, all right, that sounds feast. That sounds like a reasonable thing to do. Just follow. This is what you get when you tell your kids to follow their dreams. They do shit like this. And so he got shot. And the only way I can describe his reaction is, uh, has anyone here ever played Madden 05 or any kind of sports game where direct contact is a big issue? My brother and I used to play Madden 05 all the time when I was younger. And when the players would collide sometimes, one of them would fall down in such a way that if it were to happen in real life, they would be paralyzed for the rest of their lives. And yet five seconds later, they're back up just going, okay, Okay, what's the next play? That is how Theodore Roosevelt reacted to getting shot. He was just like, okay, um, <clears throat> I'm not coughing up blood. Okay, let's just finish this speech. Did the entire speech without any notes because his notes had gotten shot through. And so he, that, let me just say, Teddy Roosevelt was insane, but this is a badass. That is the toughest man to have ever held the office of the presidency. Can you imagine if that had happened to any politician during this campaign trail? They would have quit that shit cold turkey. Imagine if someone had tried taking a pot shot at Donald Trump and actually gotten, his, gotten him in the chest. He would have just been like, okay, fuck this, you can have it, Cruz, I'm done. I'm done, go for it. 
And so, <laughs> yeah, I still love driving around and seeing Florida's Rubio country, even though he lost in Florida. Yeah, keep those signs up. We need the reminders that every day is a good laugh. And so, William Howard Taft did not try to win the presidency back. He, his mindset was just, I'm done. If he had a political theme song and he was running nowadays, it probably would have been, I don't fuck with you by Big Sean, just continuous, I don't give a fuck, I don't give a fuck, ow, ow. And so he didn't try at all. But he got to live out his dream after the presidency. His biggest dream was to be a Supreme Court Justice. And he was made a Supreme Court Justice by President Warren Harding. And that made his career. He was so happy about that. So it really made the four years of torture that being president was worthwhile. But unfortunately, Roosevelt didn't win either because it caused a huge split in the Republican Party, leading Woodrow Wilson to take command of the country. Woodrow Wilson is one of the most educated men to ever be president. But also, he got put in at the worst fucking time ever. Because World War I was right around the corner. And at first, he took an isolationist viewpoint, where it's just like, we don't want to get involved. Roosevelt called him a pussy, and because obviously, Roosevelt's going to call everybody a pussy that doesn't want to go into a war. Who do you fucking think you're talking to? And so Woodrow Wilson was very much against it. It was actually not until he got very stern advice from his secretary, like secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt, that he decided, yeah, maybe we should take this thing seriously. And so World War One happens. We all know what happens with that one. If you don't, then I don't know what to tell you. I'm only on presidents. I don't know. Any, I don't know what to do. So. We have an issue now where the war's over and Woodrow Wilson decides, I'm wanting to start this thing called the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is pretty much going to be there to solve the world's problems before they start. And he was very heavily campaigning for it when he suffered a debilitating stroke. And after he suffered this stroke, there was only one person who could take control of the managerial aspects of the presidency. His wife. So for two years, I shit you not, we had a woman.